So hopefully you can hear me, but not too loud. Seems, sounds good from here. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, play the game as well. That was actually, uh, that was pretty good fun. So my name's uh, John Clegg. Um, I'm kind of semi-retired after about 35 years in the oil and gas industry, but I'm actually busier now than I've ever been in the past. Um, doing a number of things. I'm um, doing some consulting, technical consulting and strategic consulting. And I was lucky enough to be in Scotland yesterday with a customer who was able to pay for my trip through London today. So <laughs> that helped me I make it a little bit. Um, I do some uh, blogging and that's uh, my website. I blog a lot on innovation and you can see anything you want on there for free. Uh, I've written a couple of books and um, I'll come back to those later uh, about innovation. Uh, I will be lecturing on strategy and innovation at a business school in Bern as a visiting lecturer from the summer. And we got confirmation this week. Uh, myself and a colleague in the US have just got funded to develop some high temperature drilling equipment for drilling geothermal wells, for uh, deep geothermal wells, for high temperature fluids, for generating uh, electricity. It's a uh, renewable, renewable baseload energy. So there's a lot of different things going on. Today, I wanted to talk about innovation and really about, I'm going to talk about the importance of diversity to innovation, but before doing that, I just wanted to tell you what I think innovation is because it means different things to different people. So can anybody give, there are no right answers or wrong answers. Anybody give me a definition of innovation and what it actually means to you? Yeah. <laughs> Change, change in a positive way, making something innovative and new. Breaking boundaries. Creative ideas. Creative ideas. Okay, then. Um, so there's some really good answers there, and, and it does mean different things to different people. And I've got a definition which is different from definitions that anybody else in the room might have. We've all pretty all got different definitions. A lot of people think it's just about a new idea, but it's actually more than the new idea. It's actually getting the new idea to do something of value. It's basically doing, creating something which is good and which makes the world or the company you work for or your life or whatever a better place as a result of uh, doing it. And one of the examples I use is uh, Airbnb. And Airbnb didn't actually create anything. I mean, it hasn't invented anything. It didn't make anything physical. It just uses lots of things that already exist. It uses your smartphone for its software or maybe the operating system on your PC, it uses a browser developed by somebody else. Uh, they use your hardware and then other people's buildings to deliver a service to you. Um, but they are innovative because they created something new and of value and I use them quite a bit and if you use them, it's, uh, um, I found it to be quite a useful service. Um, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, it says that innovation is making changes in something um, by introducing new methods, ideas, or products. Now, I think the word introduction is quite important there, and I'll quote a couple of management gurus. Peter Drucker says it's the means by which they exploit change as an opportunity for a different business or a different service. That's quite a business-oriented definition. And Michael Porter, a new way of doing things which is commercialized. It's another kind of business oriented definition and my definition is it's about the creation of value um, so it's maybe making your customer more money maybe saving people time maybe making things easier or it could actually be providing much higher level um, sort of values it could be um, providing societal benefit it could be uh, being altruistic it could be providing benefit just for yourself like self-actualization or, uh, or make, making yourself feel better. It's, it's not just about the uh, idea. And I believe it lives in a value chain where you start with an idea, but the innovation process takes that idea, creates some value with it. And then if you're going to have any kind of sustainable organization, it, whether it's a for-profit or non, not for profit, there has to be some kind of value capture. You have to capture enough of that value at least to keep the organization going and, you know, sort of pay the electricity bills and pay your employees and, uh, and whatever. So it, it, 
when you, we heard the definitions by Drucker and Porter, it's really easy to hear value and think about money. And in fact, the picture I had on the previous slide with value capture had a bag full of uh, dollars kind of implies that. But value can be created and delivered in lots of different ways. And anybody here want to give me examples of something that you value or something you think is valuable that's maybe not just like the sort of making profit for a company? Time, yes. Yeah, so time, yeah. We only have a limited amount of time. Uh, so time, extremely valuable. Saving time is a great one. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, quality of life. Quality of life for individuals and quality of life for society as well. And, and there's a kind of relationship between those two, and we'll explore that a little bit later. But so. Yeah, it's the, yeah, so there's, yeah, and, and maybe we we'll go back to Airbnb. That I mean, why do I use Airbnb? I don't use Airbnb to make money for myself. I use Airbnb to give me experiences that I wouldn't otherwise have had. And most of them have been good. Not all of them, but most of them. <laughs> Okay, so um, that's my kind of innovation and, uh, and value. But the other thing I wanted to talk about briefly is um, there are challenges at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in our time. Uh, we've got issues still with untangling uh, the UK from the EU. Uh, there's a lot of global supply chain issues with inflation at the moment. Um, big issues with uh, climate change. And of course, now we've layered a conflict in Europe over the whole thing. So there's a, a lot of things that maybe make life more challenging than they either were or seem to be, not quite sure which, uh, a few years ago. And what I think that means is that um, new forces uh, act on companies. So as well as traditional market forces, you know, worrying about customers and suppliers and uh, competition and stuff like that, uh, we have to worry about um, the impact that so the impact that we have on society is reflected back in terms of the impact that society has on us. So if you're, and I'm, I'm speaking from working in the oil and gas industry, I've got some experience of this. If you have NGOs who don't like what you're doing, they can disrupt operations and make life very difficult for you. If your employees don't like what you're doing, they can refuse to work for you. And there's a lot more of this kind of... Um, uh, people choosing to work for companies based on values than there was certainly when I when I graduated and when I was younger. Um, one of the things I learned over the last few years, in fact, it produced some good because one of the reasons I went into geothermal energy instead of oil and gas is that if you want to get investors to lend you money, if you're in fossil fuels, forget it. They're not going to do it anymore. And so there are forces acting on companies now that, that didn't used to. And so that value that we create has got to include non-traditional uh, ideas of value. And, and some of the ideas that we just kicked around, it's maybe it's not just about making profit, right? Uh, it can be. Um, you can change business models. You can introduce new products and services. But as you get down to the bottom, I mean, the bottom one, improving conditions for others, social innovation, uh, is um, often, I've often heard people say that there's a conflict between making profit doing good. And I'll tell you a story that suggests that that's not actually the case. And there doesn't have to be a conflict between making money and doing good. And the story is about a company called Mambu. So Mambu was a, or is, a company that saw an opportunity at what's called the base of the pyramid, which is billions, literally billions of people who don't have access to a lot of the things that we're lucky enough to have access to um, sort of here in the UK. Um, there are billions of people that didn't have access to banking and millions of small business, about 250 million small businesses that had no access to credit. And so what Mambu did was created a bank that would serve those people. And because those people didn't have a lot of money, the bank had to operate on very, very fine margins. And so they couldn't build colossal buildings with marble columns and all that, and, you know, oak doors and all that sort of stuff that you see in banks. And so they basically used uh, fintech and they used uh, sort of uh, cell phones and cellular network to build a bank that was very low cost to operate. And they successfully served all of these customers, um, mostly in Africa, and provided services to these customers they didn't have before. So they did a lot of good for society. But it also turned out that they were actually quite good at building systems at low cost. So if you look on their website, you'll see they now have customers like Santander and uh, ABN uh, Ambro and uh, big European banks 
who are using Mambu services as back office. So what Mambu have successfully done is they're providing services to people who need them for good. And at the same time, as a direct result of doing that, they're making money. So there's no conflict between doing good and, um, and, and being profitable. Um, success, and what Mambu did was create something that met a need, a societal need, but successful innovation requires more than just meeting needs. Uh, if it did, then we'd be able to colonize other planets and we might, you know, we might be, all sorts of things we'd be able to do. So we also have, we don't yet have abundant clean energy. We haven't solved all illnesses, so we haven't met all of the needs. And the reason we can't do that is because we don't yet have all the capabilities we need. And uh, capabilities are basically things we can do that feed into uh, engineering. So anybody give me an example of what you think the capabilities might be and what a capability of an individual or a corporation or an organization uh, might be. It's basically skills, uh, skills or technologies or access to uh, science, th things that you can do. And if you take things that you can do and you marry them to uh, things that people need, then that's the root of innovation. Because if it's something that somebody needs and there's something that you can do to meet that need, then you can create that value for them. Um, and then what this value chain becomes is um, needs, could be societal needs, capabilities, which is really important. And I'll come to the reason why in a minute feed into ideas and those ideas then create the value and that's innovation and then there's kind of feedback loops in there as well but those capabilities actually have to um, exist there's a guy about 10 years now 13 years ago a guy called stephen johnson wrote a book where good ideas come from it's a really good book and in it he talked about what he called the adjacent possible and what the adjacent possible is it's there's always a new layer of discovery like scientific discovery or technological discovery which is going to get peeled back and allow things to happen that couldn't happen before. If you think about Airbnb, Airbnb couldn't have happened 15 years ago or 20 years ago because we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have APIs and not enough people had internet access and we didn't have ways of making payments over the internet as easily as we do now. Uh, but now those things do exist and so it can. And those layers get continually uh, peeled back. Um, and the inverse of that is that you know, new inventions, new technologies are dependent on the contents of, of those layers. And, couple of examples to think about. One of them is there is a remarkable number of things that were either discovered or invented independently at the same time by people. The four people, Galileo, Fabricius, Shiner, and Harrier, all discovered sunspots in 1611. And they didn't discover sunspots because they thought to look for them. They discovered them because technology, in optical technology, became available that suddenly allowed them to do it. Um, and quite often ideas can be ahead of their time. And I, I love this story. This was 1953. The uh, president of one of the um, telephone companies in the US was talking about the telephone of the future. And he said, 1953, 70 years ago, he said, telephones might get carried around by people. And they might be worn like, uh, perhaps as we carry a watch today, you might wear a telephone on your wrist. Won't have a dial and people might be able to see each other. Um, and they might even translate between languages. And uh, so the idea was there 70 years ago, but unfortunately to do it, you needed things like small batteries, um, sort of uh, rapid charging of batteries, uh, touchscreen technologies, um, mobile internet. And there was actually a mobile phone network when it got on in 1953. When I was researching that, I discovered that, that a lot of those technologies didn't exist. And so it's only when you have capabilities, and I've just listed out a whole load of technological capabilities. But we also need intellectual capabilities, and it's kind of a rhetorical question here. Is it easier to create value with a team that's all of one mind, or is it easier to create it with a diverse team? And I think you actually get a lot more value with a diverse team. And I'll give you a couple of examples there. Um, one of them is Bletchley Park. Um, Bletchley Park was the code-breaking center set up outside Milton Keynes. Uh, well, it wasn't Milton Keynes then, but outside Bletchley in World War II. Subsequently moved to uh, Cheltenham, where I live, and became GCHQ. Um, one of the things they did in the Second World War was run a uh, crossword competition in the Times uh, and um, invited the people who did best to a final in London and then had some uh, winners. 
And they actually then contacted the winners a couple of weeks later and said, you want to come and work for us at Fletcher Park? And, and they didn't look for people who were cryptologists. They looked for people who got at crosswords, people who got at different kinds of puzzles, people who got at languages. And they tried to pull together as many different skills, complementary skills, as they possibly could. And by doing that, um, we all know the story, they successfully broke the Enigma codes and potentially changed the course of history. The reverse of that is there's a guy called Matthew Syed who's he's written a couple of good books. He's written a book called Rebel Ideas, and I think it's the first chapter of this book. He talks about 9-11, and he talks about the failure of the CIA to um, predict 9-11. I mean, the CIA's job is to stop things like this from happening, and they utterly failed. And he suggests that the reason why they failed is because the CIA at the time was populated by sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males who'd all been to the same universities and they all thought exactly the same way. And there was nobody in the organization who had any kind of diversity of thought. And there was nobody who thought outside of the kind of paradigm that those guys were boxed into. There was basically nobody who thought like the uh, terrorists might have thought. And so there was nobody who even conceived that they might have done what they would have done. If, if they'd have attracted people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different ages, different genders, and so on, they might have had a better insight into the sorts of things that might drive people, the sorts of things that people might do. So if we go back to that um, chart, I guess we'll get every time I put it up, but this is the last one. Um, we think about needs kind of morphs into society. Um, by meeting needs, we can make society better. And capabilities, I think one of our most important capabilities is um, one of the most important ways of thinking about capabilities is diversity. And the more diverse our capabilities are, whether they're human capabilities, whether they're uh, technical capabilities, the more likely we are to be able to meet those needs and then create something of value. Um, now, a lot of organizations and a lot of society is very stubborn and uh, they resist change and people don't like to change. And I think part of our job is to try and encourage change and try and encourage people to think in ways that they hadn't thought before, encourage people to try and take up careers I might not have thought about before. Um, I, I listed a load of things that I did earlier on. One of them I didn't mention is I um, volunteer as a STEM ambassador. So I try and talk to people in schools and I wrote an article for their magazine uh, recently uh, to try and encourage people who might not have thought about engineering as a career to get into engineering as a career, to make sure that maybe when we do this in 20 years' time, it's not people that look like Stephen and myself, with no disrespect to Stephen, that are standing up here and, uh, and doing these talks. So I've given you a lot of opinion. Uh, there is a little bit of evidence. Um, I did make a joke earlier to Stephen and rehearsed it. And so if I tell you in advance it's a joke, somebody might laugh. Um, I heard recently, and I stole this, that the... Um, Everybody who confuses correlation and causation finishes up dying. So, Mike Rock, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it appears to me that there is a there's correlation on this chart. There's a couple of outliers, but this chart is basically, it's one I saw in um, one of the uh, business, I think it might be in Harvard, Harvard Business Review a few years ago. And I basically reconstructed it from most recent data. So it's like 2020 or 2021 data. And on the left-hand axis, you've got the uh, World Intellectual Property Organization's Global Innovation Index. That's talking about how innovative uh, countries are and how much value they generate. And on the horizontal axis, we've got uh, the Gini uh, Inequality Index. And there's a couple of outliers, most notably the US and China, which tend to be more innovative than their inequalities, because both, both of them have a significant amount of inequality might maybe a bit more innovative than their inequality would suggest. But broadly speaking, it looks like the more equal a society is or a country is, the more innovative it is and the more value it uh, creates. And I don't think that's coincidence. I think there is actually a correlation there. There's a guy, there's a guy I, I follow and whose books I've read, and you can probably see from the picture, I've read his book quite a lot because there's a lot of markers in it. Tom Goodwin. And... He says, the clear reality is that pulling people together from a range of backgrounds is the best way to work. And pretty much every process, he says almost every single process in the world, because the way he talks is always like superlative, but pretty much every process benefits from having varieties of inputs. And we saw examples in Bletchley Park, 9-11. Uh, there's much more mundane examples than that, but they're all the same. Generally, the more 
diversity you have in your inputs to doing something, the better the output is going to be. And uh, that's why I would encourage free preaching to the converted in this room, but hopefully we can find a way to encourage uh, a lot more people uh, outside of this room that uh, this is a, uh, a good way to think. Um, if you want to know more, uh, I did write a couple of books. I've actually got a few copies here. If, if, if anybody would like a free copy, then come up and badger me either during the uh, conversation or afterwards. I've got four, so it's the first four people, basically. And I'll be really upset if nobody comes. Um, but um, there's a lot more of the kind of things I've been talking about in these books, if anybody's interested. And uh, with that, I am going to hand back to Penny, and I think we're into uh, roundtable discussions. Um, so for now, I'm going to talk a little about about me and DIY women. So first of all, we're going to have a bit of a challenge. Um, so I want you to get out your phones and use social media to find out about DIY women versus me telling you about it. You've got one minute. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, if you're struggling, I can go to the next slide, but... Yeah, I'll, I'll put that in the reception video. <laughs> I mean, but do you use the internet? So, yeah, I'll get it. Do you know? Internet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to try because it'll be interesting to see your learnings from it. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, you've got half a minute left. <laughs> Out of concentration. Have you? <laughs> Oh no. Okay, ten seconds. And also have a think about how it could be better as well. I'm not just using all the way. Yeah, I'm focusing on it. There used to be web, which was moving an engineering building there. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like that I used to put with it. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're going to have one person from each table, I'll just feel free to speak up. What, what did you find? What is DIY Women? Tell me a little bit about it. Just speak up. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> they are. <laughs> and, and maybe from this table, how was the experience in trying to trying to find that? Like, what could be better? You know, the level of communication. Any comments on that? Okay, interesting. So yeah, who who first? Yeah, where where did people start? So TikTok, Instagram, website, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, yeah, and then you Google. Interesting. Yeah, so um, as you guys can see, you know, these are the, the different forms of social media, I guess, that, that I use. But, you know, enough about me. I want to maybe the next exercise just for one minute. Um, Google the persons next to you, organization or where they work. <laughs> yeah. Or the personal. <laughs>
Okay, you got ten seconds left. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with the with the search with the person next to you or across from you, I want you to say one thing that was good about it and one thing that could be improved. About the website. About how you found information on their organization, whether that's website, LinkedIn, Instagram, just whatever you found, what was good and what could be improved. I got you to do that exercise is because over 60% of job seekers now are using their phone to find out information about a company or organization and even more are now especially the younger generation are using their phones to apply for a job which gives me nightmares but <laughs> but that is so you know just really think about how um, your company or organization is communicated through your phone whatever social media platform it is what messaging you're sending and um, you know, I've, I've won, done roundtable discussions with various engineering firms and the, all of their images are, are stock images. And I'm like, you know, if you're trying to recruit more, you know, diversity and innovation, have people, you know, have the real people who are doing the work. And I think that's something that it, it can be missed. And especially if I was applying for a job, the first thing I would do is go and look on their website and social media. And I would make a pretty quick decision if I want to work for them or not. And um, so yeah, take take back that take on board that feedback, make any changes, or maybe don't make any changes if you're perfect. <laughs> and so yeah, just a, a brief intro about you know DIY women, as you guys already told me, so I don't need to do any of the work. Is it was workshops to equip and empower women with practical skills. And really the main end goal is trying to create a more diverse and inclusive engineering, construction, and trades workforce. So you know, it's a, it's a massive goal <laughs> and it's one that I, I can't achieve alone, but it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. And um, the way that I've, you know, been working on this for the past year, uh, the way that I've been going about this is splitting it into two sections. So workshops and um, focusing on, you know, in-person workshops 
and also kind of virtual ones, which is the ones that um, Alex brought up there about the candle kit. So I, I did a film, um, you know, an instructional video that um, people would take the kit home and then they would make it using uh, the video that I made online. So I've been doing, you know, a lot of exploring, a lot of learning through this as well. Um, and then the second one is uh, trying to create, you know, that community, very much similar to, to the iMakey, really. You know, they have thousands of members and it's creating you know a, a membership and a community that have the the same goal and um, so really my focus is you know celebrating other people's DIY stories and um, this woman down here she's a she wanted a job as a scaffolder she you know reached out to different companies and they said yeah sure we'll have you so um again you know just an amazing story which I think should be celebrated and incredible role model which could really inspire other um other people not just just women um you know, here's just kind of some, I guess, on the communication level. This was a poster I designed for an upcycling coffee table workshop, which I ran. And here is a woman which, uh, when she first arrived, uh, her daughter actually laughed at her for coming to this workshop. She was like, Mum, why are you going to that? You can't do that. And um, she'd never used any of the equipment before. First time she saw the band, saw, heard the noise, was terrified of it. You know, after she'd done, you know, her first cut, she was very good and, you know, she felt really empowered after it, which is one of the reasons, you know, I set up DIY Women. Um, again, you know, just various... Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is in a workshop down in Aylesbury. And I think one challenge that I face and probably maybe similar, I guess, maybe to She Can Engineer as well is I, I faced criticism from the workshop guy here. He said, well, this workshop is only for women or people who identify as women. And I hummed and hawed, you know, couldn't sleep that night because I thought maybe I, you know, maybe I am discriminating. Maybe I need to make it mixed, even though I, I was also hosting a mixed workshop the, the week after. Um, and then that evening, I went into the workshop to do a final practice through of, of the coffee table myself. And I went in and it's like an open workshop. Anyone can go and I'm the only woman there. <laughs> and I was reminded, this is why, the following evening I ran my workshop and I had five women um, participate who had never even been in this space before. And I was reminded, this is why I have set up DIY Women because kind of like the, you know, creating that safe space um, and it was an environment which they felt they could learn in. Um, and yeah, just kind of some more pictures here, them all with their tables. You know, we got there in the end as well. Um, but it was, you know, it was an extremely rewarding experience for me. And I've learned so much, you know, through that journey. And if you'd said to me last year that I would have managed to, you know, get a whole bunch of strangers into a room and teach them how to make a table, I would I would have laughed in your face. And the reason I've, I've been able to do this was through a program called uh, the Young Innovators Program. Um, so it's essentially, you know, a co actually I've got a, yeah, I, it's essentially a, a grant which you get £5,000 uh, from the UK government, but it's not just about the money, it's the fact that you get one-to-one -one business coaching. So you're paired up with a, you know, experienced person in industry, they're able to, you know, offer you advice at key decision points, but more importantly, what I find most useful is actually being connected with other young innovators across the UK. So every Tuesday morning at seven o'clock, which I hate, but it's it's always good afterwards, we have an accountability session. So, you know, what challenges are, are you facing this week? What are you what are you say you're gonna do? And are you actually gonna do it? Because to do this program, I went part-time in my engineering job, and then two days of the week I would work on DIY women. And that, you know, I learned so much during that process. Um, and I think it's an amazing uh, program. So if you guys know anyone, you know, anyone who has an idea and wants to turn it into business or someone who already has a business um, and wants to, you know, take it to that next stage or maybe wants to, you know, go in a different direction with it as well. Um, this is a, a program which is available. There's a video, but we're going to skip past it um, because of time. Um, so back to the slide before. Another thing as well in terms of just generally programmes, um, I noticed on one of the post-it notes there, you were talking about, you know, university groups. So I was actually the president of the Female, Engineer, Female Engineering Society um, at Glasgow University, which was called FemEng, and my dad would always say, what about MenEng? <laughs> and I would tell him, Dad, you should come to my lectures, that is MenEng. Um, but so that that's something, you know, that I would really encourage um, people to look at and really connect with is there is some incredible, you know, university and college societies that are already there. They're already set up and 
they we really benefit from you know industry speakers and, and and really current industry experience as well so if, if you're able to join those dots i think there's you know massive benefit that can come from it and um, i was also part of the equate student ambassador hub so there's something in scotland called the equate uh, network and it's basically about you know getting more equality and diversity in stem um, so they have a, a network across Scotland um, and they you know, have new student ambassadors each year. So that's something, you know, a service as well that I would recommend people look into. And there was another one as well, um, a quite handprint. So we 3D printed a prosthetic, um, a, a prosthetic for a young boy in Glasgow and we did that at university. But through that process, again, coming back to innovation, I learned so much, you know, when we first measured the measured it, the prosthetic for the, the young boy. Um, it was, you know, the start of the year. When we gave it to him, it was the end of the year, and he'd grown about this much. <laughs> so we were panicking. But, you know, it was, and through that group, it was not just, I, I did product design engineering, but it was also biomedical engineer, electrical engineering. And it was really that cross-pollination, um, you know, in, ensured that that was a success at the end of the day. Um, but anyways, now we're going to get up off of our seats and we're going to do a little um, making exercise, I guess. Um, so you guys are all going to make a little Jesonite pot. Um, so if we come to the, if you guys all want to get up and we come to the back room here. Uh, so I'll introduce myself. Some of you have already met me, but um, my name is Stephen McAvoy. I'm, well, I'm not actually a system engineer at Sellfield anymore. I was until Christmas, uh, and for the last three weeks, I've been a project engineer for a sister company still under the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, uh, Magnox Limited. So Magnox have the original fleet of nuclear reactors in the country and decommissioning the So I've, I've made a bit of a jump, but when I agreed to do this, I was still a system engineer at Sellafield. Uh, so I've, I've spent 10 years there. I started um, as a graduate in 2013 uh, and I spent most of that 10 years trying to innovate and struggling. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the site and some of you I'm sure are familiar with Sellafield. Um, it was in itself a, a product of innovation. It was, it was built sort of post-war into the 1950s. Um, initially to produce plutonium for atomic bombs um, and to give you an idea of the pace of, of innovation that was going on if you see these this picture on the right with the, the two wind scale piles um, the the top of those stacks look quite unique and that's because they have filters at the top of the chimneys that were added very much as an afterthought uh, normally if you were building something like that you put the, the filters at the base where you might be able to maintain them and, and have a design at the start uh, and that was to one of the physicists who was high up in the, in the company at the time uh, was adamant that they absolutely had to have these in case there was ever a fire <laughs> and to this day they're still known as Cockcroft's Follies uh, and in 1957 they saved quite a large part of the country when there was indeed a fire in one of those piles and the filter caught an awful lot of contamination so that gives you an idea of, of the pace that, that there used to be um, and in the picture on the left that was the world's first civil uh, nuclear reactor that was feeding into the grid. That's a picture of the Queen opening it. Um, so that's an early Magnox reactor, which I'm now working on the sister side of that in, in Chapel Cross in Scotland, uh, at the other end of the, of the life cycle decommissioning it. Uh, and uh, even into the 1960s and 70s, they were still innovating the, uh, so the wind scale advanced, advanced gas cooked reactor prototype is on site, known as the Gulf Ball past it. Uh, Thorpe, the thermal oxide reprocessing plant, uh, that ran until 2018. Uh, and that was, I think, at one point, the biggest building site in Europe. Um, so there's a lot of trial and error and rapid innovation. Uh, unfortunately, that sort of trial and error in the nuclear industry uh, had came to a head in a, a quite a famous incident that I'm sure you all have heard of and be familiar with. So what happened at Chernobyl was essentially a, a safety test and, a, and an innovation to see if the cooling water pumps could be run by the inertia of the turbine uh, in a, possibly in a, in a, I guess in, a, in an incident where you ran out of backup power. Uh, and for, I mean, a number of reasons, there were design, design deficiencies within the reactor, uh, operator inexperience. In fact, halfway through the test, there was a 
there was a shift handover done, so the shift changed completely to a new group of people that didn't really know what was happening. They lost control of the trial, and well, we all know what happens, happens next. Um, so that picture was actually one I took in 2018. Uh, I went to visit and I, I saw the, the um, new safe containment that had been dragged across over the top of the, the original sarcophagus of the reactor that was, I think, the biggest moving object ever, ever made. Um, so that's, I sort of wanted to talk about that because um, that, I think, has had a big impact across the industry ever since in how you experiment and, and uh, we were talking earlier about trial and error, and it's that error in the new, in the industry you can't afford to fail. So my role for the last ten years uh, has been in, a, in an operational facility, um, so that's mostly mechanical handling equipment. Those sort of blue and grey buildings near the bottom right of the site, uh, and that's um, transporting radio radioactive waste through. In, into interim storage for the next sort of 50, 60 years. So you can imagine all the mechanical equipment, well shoes with very heavy duty. I had one crane that weighed about 400 tons and it could only lift 20 tons. That's the sort of very heavy duty. Um, and when it comes to trying to improve something or replace an obsolete part, you get one chance every year. There's a site outage, you get three, four weeks. Um, and, and to even get to the point where you are ready to implement a change, you've got multiple committees to go through. Uh, everything needs to be considered environmental, radiological, absolutely at hazard. And if, it, if, if you make the change and it doesn't quite have the result you wanted, that's it. It's in operations again for another year. And, and that level of, I suppose, bureaucracy and, and, and red tape um, really stifles innovation in, in, in the industry. Uh, and of course, it, with it being such a secure site, there's no easy option to, to bring in sort of build diverse teams quickly to, to go and solve problems. Uh, you're very much relying on the on the staff that you've, you've got in the area. Uh, they might have bedding that you have to go through to even get in, in these buildings is, is uh, unbelievable. So the, the pace of innovation, it would be fair to say, is quite slow. Uh, so I'll, I'll sort of move on to what what they did uh, like produce in the last few years. This is supposed to be a, a good message. <laughs> so we mentioned earlier we were talking at this table about Spot the Dog. So that's the yellow robot. In some ways, it's a bit terrifying. Uh, it can if you kick it over and it will stand back up again. You can climb stairs and it can do all sorts of things. Um, so this uh, 2020, obviously we all know what happened around March. 2020. Um, th there had long been plans to build something like this, and, and when that happened, it was sort of the kick to, to get it get it going. So this is a fairly nondescript shed in, in an industrial estate five miles from the site. Uh, usually, it's distance from the site, so that has sort of many factors. Uh, if you're on a nuclear site, you've got to adhere to site license condition set by government. Uh, if you're off the site, you can do what you like. Uh, so this was a place where it's, it's much easier to build those diverse teams to get people together from supply chain and other, other industries and other companies and to solve problems. So one of the key things that, that they tried to do at the site, um, at the Centre of Excellence, is what they call sprint projects. So you'll gather together a team uh, on, on day one, a six-week sprint, you'll give them a problem statement. And that's a, a real problem on the site, whether it's something that needs to be recovered in a radioactive area, uh, some sort of improvement that you want to make. Um, and you'll set that team off with six weeks and a, and a fairly limited budget. Um, and, and at the end of that six weeks, the, the hope is that you'll have a proof of concept. Uh, so you'll go through rapid prototyping, um, concept generation, iterative process, um, Lots of failures, but that's how it should be. Sort of failing fast uh, and, and not spending too much money in the process. And then at, at the end of that, that will then get taken on by a, a sort of a smaller team that of staff members to then go through, jump through all the regulatory hoops and, and go to all the committees and, and actually implement it on, on the site. Um, 
so yeah, it's it's a it's a safe space, um, and and the team's really very in experience, disciplines, industries, backgrounds, uh, in in every everywhere possible really. Um, so this is a bit of a bit of a dodgy uh, animation, but this is some of the different areas within the centre of excellence. So so what I'm mostly talking about is uh, engineering development solutions at, at the top there. That's the the sprint project part of it. You'll see that they've got remotely operated vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicles or, or drones. Um, there's a big focus on social impact as well as, as to how you can help the local area. It's not the um, not, not the most affluent of, of local areas. So Sellafield, I think it employs about 13,000 people. It's by far and away the, the biggest employer in the area and, and they, they do try to give back a lot to to the, to the people in the area and, and develop the towns and, and so on. So there are actually big plans in, around the industrial estate they're currently occupying to, to build a campus um, that's going to include a lot of innovative small businesses and, and it's a bit of an incubator. So that's will be coming to West Cumbria in the next few years with uh, government support. But ultimately it's about that collaborative approach. So you've got all these really good different groups that can all chip in to these projects and, and help deliver these solutions. And it's really a space to allow that different thinking. Um, so yeah, yeah, as I say, we'll, we'll focus mainly on engineering development solutions, and the, uh, the sprint project. Um, so those, these problems come from all around the business and I'll, I'll show some examples uh, as best I can. There's obviously a, a lot of stuff I can't show. Um, and it's that six week and model to, to come out with a, essentially a prototype or a proof of concept to show that the idea at least is signed. Um, and that'll get reported back to senior management, uh, the stakeholders from the plant that, that need to change. Um, and, and those full time members will then go and do the facilitation, the, the slow, laborious nuclear bit, um, which frustrated me so. <laughs> uh, and, and another, obviously, you know, Key benefit is that it develops the teams and they get to see the benefit of working with people from different backgrounds um, and it's really key for uh, so Sellafield are one of those companies that have the um, NPDS scheme with Jeremy McGee to work towards the UK spec so I went through all of that and, and became chartered a few years ago uh, and it's it's a really good way to tick off some, some really good competencies and, and quite quickly compared to the, the pace that the rest of the industry allows so this is, I actually borrowed this from from, from the uh, the scheme itself. So this gives you an idea of of how it steps through in that six week period, uh, and it gets to the, the final design, the proof of concept, and then and then right over at the right hand side is is where the benefit gets realised by by the full time sort of person that's left behind from the team, if you like. Uh, and it's it's really about yeah rapid prototyping, feeling fast and that sort of blue sky out of the box thinking. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about some of the, I'll touch on some of the, some of the uh, examples of, of what have been done. So there's, uh, so you'll see some improvement projects that like jaw collets uh, in, in one of the Magnox uh, reprocessing plants. Um, and, and they're really, I mean, they're, these are some, some key plants. If you see heels, that's a highly active liquor. Uh, so, so that's a really nasty plant to, Try and do anything in so it's you're relying on robotics and, and uh, remote manipulation uh, it's all behind meters of shielding and um, pcm drums that's uh, plutonium contaminated so it, it's not just the sort of the lighter end of the site that's benefiting from these uh, these projects and these improvements these are sort of making a real difference and as you can imagine with if you're dealing with plutonium and highly active liquid the costs are astronomical so so I'm sort of showing on the right hand side that that benefit uh, year on year the, the plan is in the next sort of three years of looking to be saving nearly 20 million pounds a year in, in fees just with the projects that are that are running through the sprint process uh, and they're at the point now where they're generally sort of running two sprint projects in, in tandem so they're getting through quite a lot of these every year um, so that's the that's the model of how it all works. Um, here are some of the 
companies and, and other players in industry that have been sort of heavily involved. So, I mean, submarine delivery agency, that's in, inside the MOD. There's a lot of smaller contractors and consultancy firms that provide sort of expertise and provide their people in and secondments for that six week period. Uh, Magnus, new employer, had to put them at the top. Uh, they've again come with a lot of similar sort of problems. Uh, nuclear reactor sites that you maybe need to go and characterize something or um, retrieve something. So, this is a really good way to come up with that proof of concept. Uh, and yeah, really, that's, that's my. My presentation, I think we've finished just about in time. So I was going to have a quick QA if anybody has any burning questions, but if you do have anything you want to talk about as well, my email address is there. Uh, yeah. I can't speak for every industry, but with the, the as I've said, sort of the stages and the gates and the, and the levels of bureaucracy and nuclear, it's it's about the only way that you can do it. Um, I'm sure there are other industries, maybe within sort of fintech and things, where things generally move fast and where you don't need to go down that route. But certainly in this field, it's, it's, I think it's been a, a game changer. Is the, All right. Uh, Do you 
or is it much more beneficial to have those hard people doing it with a competitor or doing it with someone from a totally different industry? That what do you see that that is the future? I guess I think that collaborative approach is definitely the way to go. So, so Sellafield is lucky; it has the size and the budget yeah. that it can it can do that for itself. And it, it actually some of the early projects were for some of the neighbours in the industrial estate, the aluminium extrusion companies that, and, and the, I think early on they were struggling to get enough problems in because the plants weren't providing them, so, so they looked elsewhere and they collaborated that way. Um, and I think there's no reason why they wouldn't invite more and more other small, medium enterprises in to work on these projects and, and invite other companies in to, to give their problems. And certainly if, if you're running like a medium engineering, you want to be working with other sort of medium sized engineering firms in an incubator, if you like, or whatever other the dog you have? Was that the Foster Dynamics? Yeah, yeah. They've, they've got through quite a few of those at Sellafield. They're, they're more. I mean, it's interesting because we're in the BMOD days, we, we, we did Wilbarra, which was like the, the, the Fox Boat. And, yes. and, and it was, you know, clunky engineering, sort of using the motors like the wheelchairs. But a friend of mine, he's, he's, he's still sort of carrying on his kinetic. And they, they've now got something that's based on the Boston Dog. It's a real brace of the Boston Dog. He walks up there, picks his thing up, moves it around, goes upstairs, goes and We have trouble with it getting up a ramp. Mm -hmm. And you know, and if you think of the space of time and how that's changed, yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. purely because of different concepts of people, uh, you know, I think people like the Rovers and all that stuff, they need to look forward. So, and then it, that, that's, you know, that's now been used by this photo of the concepts and all this yeah, and it's you know, it's that point I lost a lot in the, in the no. it's you know a great thing for sort of security. But ten years ago, if they could have produced that, it probably yeah. wouldn't have been a radiation sort of radiation tolerant at all. Yeah, but at least now it's, it can work for a while.